Welcome everyone, the Board of Education meeting is called to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> all right, welcome everyone. Um, Secretary Torres is running a little bit late, so until Secretary Torres shows up, we will ask Member Jocelyn to step in. So, Member Jocelyn, would you please take roll? Sure. All members are here except for Member Torres. Thank you. Thank you. Colleagues, moving on now to the approval of tonight's agenda. So, unless there are objections, the agenda will be approved with one amendment this evening. Recommendation 7123-24. Under consideration of certain purchases, will be removed from new business. Okay. All right, we've got uh, a very exciting way to open up our meeting tonight. We've got some recognitions here. So I would first like to invite Lucy Miles up to the podium, and uh, member Pat Donahue will join Ms. Miles at the podium. So we are very excited to welcome Waterford Mott High School Teacher Consultant, Lucy Miles. Lucy has served in the roles of Special Education Teacher and Special Education uh, cons Teacher Consultant in the Waterford School District for over 30 years. She has dedicated her career to serving students and families in our community and has proven herself as an expert in the field of special education. She is knowledgeable, dependable, thoughtful, and quick on her feet. Recently, Lucy was honored at a special reception as the recipient of the 2024 Dev Awards Educational Service Award, presented by the ARC of Oakland County. The ARC of Oakland County is a nonprofit agency that works through education, research, and advocacy to improve the quality of life for children and adults with cognitive, intellectual, and developmental disabilities here in Oakland County. And so at this time, we're going to share a brief video prepared by the Ark of Oakland County, highlighting Lucy and her amazing contributions to our students and families. When Lucy Miles enters a classroom filled with students her and her team work with, you can feel the change in energy immediately. And then you know what you do with the rest of the dough? Yeah. Then you roll it some more. 
One of the recent projects they're working on is making dog treats. Had students rolling, cutting, and preparing them for the baking process. The entire procedure completed by someone else's hands. Just the way she believes people with developmental disabilities learn <laughs> best. I'm not doing any good for pets. I'm doing everything for them. I need them to know what they can do for themselves, to be in, as independent as possible. She always puts the responsibility on the student, but does that in a way in which she's building their ability. She realizes that a lot of her students, they really lack confidence. They, they don't know that they can do this on them. And so she's not giving them a handout. She's building their confidence and they can be successful. Doing what I need to do to support kids where they're at and get them to that point of, I can do it. And I'm going to do it. And I want to do it. It's really important. Lucy grew up with parents who fostered children, many with developmental disabilities. So she learned in her own developmental years how to maximize others' potential and learning. That is what got my heart when I was working with kids that I really felt that um, they needed me, I needed them, that we could um, really do a lot of good work together. Fast forward 30 years and you have a leader in the department at Waterford Mott that continues to excel at learning and inclusion. I feel that every individual has a purpose and that we all serve each other in making that happen. Astonishingly, in all her years of <coughs> singing at her craft, this is the first time she's ever been recognized with an award for her talents. And as humble and as shy as she is when talking about it, others are happy to let her know that what she's doing for their school and community is really special. Losing one of those big awards that she really is irreplaceable. What she brings to our school, to our community, to our families. To me, that's the, the, the greatest testament to her value is how, what, how much she means to the, the students and to their families. So congratulations, Lucy. Um, this is amazing. I, Member Donahue, um, so we have a whole certificate for you. Oh, thanks. Um, the, least, the least that we can do that for it. That is awesome. Thank for you. 30 years of amazing, amazing coming. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me here to help me celebrate um, this incredible award. It means so much to be recognized for um, the work that I love so much. Um, I... The best part of working, I love working for Waterford Schools. I've spent my entire career here. One of the most special things was I got to work at elementary to high school. And um, last year, my last class from Sandberg Elementary graduated from my high school. And that has just been really important to me. So just to see kids all the way through there. Um, schooling has been awesome, and I love the work that we do. Um, I have incredible support with administration and special education staff and um, my special education supervisors that um, it makes my work just really powerful and incredible. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. Correct. She gets a bag too. She gets a bag. <laughs> <laughs> so. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. So. Lucy, Lucy, just you, say, you might have some uh, some board members who might want to say some nice things. I'm going to start. Please. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Lucy, just to say, you know, as a as a building principal um, in a different district, to see that is just so heartwarming. As a teacher consultant, when you're working in the classrooms, you can see how the students just brighten with that and uh, um, and it's because of teachers like you and the, and the work that you do that when we when we talk about the future is bright in Waterford it's because of you that those students futures are brighter so thank you very much Member Sutherland I'm sorry I'm so touched by that video and by your amazing words um, there were a few things that you said uh, that you help kids to know not only that, they, that you turn it around so that I can do it, I want to do it, I will do it. 
and about meeting each child where they are and helping them to get to, to that sense of accomplishment and confidence. Um, you talked about um, they needed me and I needed them. Um, what a beautiful symbiotic relationship that is because you obviously have just a heart of gold that you give and give and give. And, um, and then you talked about we all serve each other. Um, your service to our community for 30 years, I, I think one of the most profound privileges of being a board member is the opportunity to meet some of our extraordinary teachers like you. Um, it touched my whole heart to see what you do in the classroom. We couldn't be more grateful for your service in the Waterford School District and for the difference you make in our community and most especially in the lives of all of those students that you have touched every step of the way. So with a heart filled with gratitude, thank you for everything that you have done. Congratulations on this much deserved award. Member Wagner. Well, I can say with experience that I know how wonderful she is and can reiterate the team that is over at Met Mott High School because I also have to acknowledge Ms. Jones who snuck in. <laughs> We have a wonderful team of teacher consultants over there, and, and you definitely have touched our students, and, and my, own, my own child has benefited greatly from, from both of you, and you are just such an awesome part of our team, and I'm incredib incredibly grateful that you have stayed here all 30 years, and, and to see those, those kids and their smiles, and to know that you recognize them and acknowledge them, and they have worth, and that's so important to know that, especially, you know, it's hard in high school, especially with kids who do have special needs, and I just, I commend you because you are a, an amazing person, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. We, we now have another really exciting um, recognition here. We are going to welcome Dylan Scott, please, to join member Donahue up here and uh, our, uh, and our athletic director, Allison Sartorius, is here. So we are thrilled, um, we are thrilled to welcome and introduce Kettering Captain Dylan Scott the 2024 MHSAA Division I Wrestling State Champion. And Dylan wrestles at 175 pounds. I mean, as we recognize Dylan on this um, amazing and phenomenal accomplishment, Dylan would also like to take the time to thank his parents, as well as his coaches, to name but a few. Coach Imus, Coach Imus, thank you. Coach White, Coach O, okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. thank you. Coach Reeb, Coach Willits, Coach Heckler, Coach Heglin, Coach Hanna, and all of his teammates, especially Emily Medford, who was the girls' state runner-up and was a support system for Dylan on and off the mat. As a student athlete at Waterford Kettering, Dylan, Dylan didn't just wrestle. He's been a member of three other varsity sports, including two years varsity lacrosse, four years varsity track, and three years varsity football. Dylan began wrestling at Mason Middle School in seventh grade. And actually, his freshman year at Kettering, he chose to play basketball in the winter. <laughs> he quit basketball about halfway through the season and asked Coach Hannah if he could join the wrestling team. And it was then when he realized that he was, in fact, a wrestler. <laughs> uh, I really loved reading this section here. So his freshman year, he wrestled at 160 pounds with no accolades. By a sophomore year, Dylan was a 160-pound district runner-up, third-place regional finisher, and a state qualifier. His junior year, his accomplishments grew as he was a 165-pound LVC champ third place in Oakland County and districts, fourth in regionals, and again, state qualifier, finishing with one win and two losses at states. His senior year, Dylan wrestled at 175 and finished as the Oakland County runner-up, the LVC champ, district champ, regional champ, and again, MHSAA division one state champ. That's amazing stuff. So we're now going to share a brief clip highlighting uh, just a couple of uh, Dylan's 
accomplishments. Today. So I'm going to start with the introduction because it introduces him. He's obviously the one um, in the gray, the reddish shoes, pink, red? Pink. Pink, okay, pink <laughs> shoes. And then I'll skip to period three and his overtime match. Or overtime. Yeah. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, let's turn that down. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Let's try that again. was not expecting that. Oh my gosh, let's again, let's try right here. Mike Jane, Sarah, help. <laughs> All right. That's better. All right, so we're going to scroll over to the period three. All right, so it's nine and a half minutes, so we're going to go to the period three. There we go. <laughs> we know how it ends. <laughs> Okay, first takedown wins.
Right, there we go. Dylan, you know, congratulations. That's amazing. Yeah. I know Member Donahue has a couple things for you. Yeah. Up to there. Dylan, how old are you? Uh, 18. Sir. You're 18. All right. So, uh, congratulations. This certificate of recognition from the Waterford School Board, Waterford School District. Congratulations not only from all of us um, on the school board, but from the district and the athletic department. And I just want you to see something. You're 18 and 175. I'm 53 and 175. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta get back into shape. <laughs> so, uh, so congratulations to you very much, absolutely, with everything. I think this is for you some stuff from there. So, yes, absolutely. So, so Dylan, really quick, what's next for you? Um, I will be going to Nebraska Southeast Community College. Um, I'm going there on a full ride just to, you know, get my GPA up, and then uh, my sophomore year when I graduate there, I'll retake my SATs and then hopefully come back to Michigan and, um, you know, wrestle back here, back home. Um, I just have a few things to say. Uh, I just, I know it's a, it's a silly sport, you know, it's, you know, it's wrestling, it's fun, it's, it's a good time, and I had a lot of, you know, tears and, you know, a lot of things went into it, but at the end of the day, it, it's, it's about the hardships that you go through, and it really builds character. Um, I feel like most people are, you know, most people have grown up with a sport of some kind or some hard type of hardship, and that, that's my sport, you know, that's, that's what I do. I do that for fun, I do that for, for work, you know, it's, it's it, it meant a lot. And uh, I thank you, thank you all for, you know, being here, obviously, and <laughs> recognizing me, it, it means a lot. Um, so thank you. Member Patricia, please. Um, and again, I, I appreciate wrestling. The amount of work it takes. Uh, you mentioned 175. I think I graduated at 145. <laughs> so it's, I've grown some since then. But uh, I had three boys, and wrestling was one of the sports I did not want them to play. Uh, I had a nephew that wrestled. I was up watching his meet one day, and the paramedics were there three times. Because they're dumping kids on heads, and yeah. hey, this, is, this is crazy. I, I just don't like this. I, it, and it was an all-day event. You go to your meet, so your parents thank them tremendously. I liked basketball. It was simple. It never rained or snowed. Again, similar to wrestling. Uh, but it was over in a couple of hours. Yeah. And I didn't have to do that. I didn't have to worry about them as much. Uh, the, the mental toughness of wrestlers. I've had some good friends that have wrestled throughout the years. And it just, it's, you're a different beast. You can take the opportunities and the adversaries, and it just, you seem to roll with them better. Um, I admire that, that, that you're able to do it, and thank your parents for being there to support you in that sport. Thank you. Member Wagner, please. I just want to say it's not a silly sport. You did great. That is, wrestling is, a, there's, as Rob said, it's, it's a lot of, like, also mental toughness, too. So I think you should be incredibly, incredibly proud of yourself. You accomplished something no one else in the state did. You are the state champ. That is huge. You can carry that with you forever. So you, you did amazing. You should be incredibly proud, and we're incredibly proud of you. Again, I just want to echo these same comments. We are so, so proud of you. Uh, we were watching you. We know um, when Emily and the two of you were going on to the finals like that, uh, I know that it might not, as an 18-year-old, you might not recognize the magnitude of what that means, but our school district also got to shine because you shined. And mm -hmm. it's a tremendous thing for us to send someone of your character, of your caliber, and to have people here at the Waterford School District. So you represent us beautifully. We want to thank you so much for your integrity for when you talk about building character. That's, that's exactly what it's all about. And um, you obviously have that in spades. So we just want to thank you so much for, for, for the incredible amount of um, dedication. We want to thank your parents and your athletic director and your coaches and, and your teammates and all the people who helped support you along the way. Um, but uh, the victory is yours, and we commend you for that. Congratulations. Well thank done. You. It, um, it's not about the success, it's about the inspiration, ma'am. 
Yeah, well, we appreciate the success. You did so good. <laughs> I didn't have to do anything. I look good, so thank you. Oh, thank you. Really thank wonderful. You. Thank you. Congratulations. Yeah. I just, you know, how do you follow all of this? But <laughs> congratulations. Great job. My kids wrestled for two years in middle school, and finally I learned how to score and how everything worked, and then they were on to something else. Yeah. So, I mean, to be dedicated to one sport for that long and... I can't even imagine what it was like for your parents in those stands. I mean, all of Ford Field was looking at you, you know, when this happened. So congratulations. Enjoy it. Thank you, ma'am. Enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. Congratulations. We love being able to hear from um, our amazing teachers, our amazing students. Um, as Member Sutherland said, it is truly one of the one of the best parts of serving on a board of education. So thank you, thank you, everyone. Okay, colleagues, we're now going to move on to public comments on action items. I don't currently have any green cards um, at the moment. So is there anyone who would like to address the board this evening? Yes, sir. Sir, is your um, so? As a real quick clarification, um, right now, we're, excuse me, we're taking public comments on things that we're going to vote on. Yeah. Uh, okay, good, excellent. So while you're getting up there, I will read our standard reminder here. So um, all of our uh, public comments are limited to three minutes in duration. Members of the public are invited to share comments. However, this is not intended to be a time for question and answers. And lastly, participants may speak only once on the same topic. And are, of course, asked to avoid statements that are personally directed, abusive, or obscene. So, welcome. Hi, my name is Wesley Evans. Um, I'm re representing some a neighborhood uh, about the site at 5200 Hudson Drive. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this. It's a cement opening, cement crushing company. Um, just wanted to see if I could get you guys to vote on a non-binding resolution to oppose granting the special approval for the Planning Commission next Tuesday. I'm just trying to bring awareness. Um, I'm not trying to interrupt the meeting, just sure. trying to bring as much awareness as I can to it for, this, for the high school. Absolutely. For the surrounding so, neighborhoods. So that is, we're not voting on, um, on anything related to do with, with the 200 Hudson site this evening. Okay. Um, you are uh, Mr. Landry, is that what it is? Evans. Evans, sorry, yes. Mr. Evans. We would uh, invite you to stick around to um, make sure that we hear what you, uh, your proposal here at public comments on non-action items towards okay. the, uh, the end of the meeting, if that's okay, Mr. Evans. Yeah, that's fine. Just Excellent. Fine. Excellent. And if it gets too late, um, there are green cards up there. If you okay. do have to leave, and you can fill those out, and you can run that up to uh, uh, Ms. Megan Roberts, and then we'll be able to follow up with you. So we want to be respectful of your time, but we also want to hear what you have to say. Awesome. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Council. Thank you so much, Mr. Roberts. Thank you. Okay, thank you again, Mr. Evans, for your patience here. Okay, anyone else who'd like to address the board this evening? Okay, excellent. Colleagues, we're now gonna move on to our consent agenda. So uh, unless there are objections, the consent agenda is approved as presented. Okay. Colleagues, we're now gonna move on to our information items and we're gonna welcome Mrs. Yvonne Dixon up to talk about the purchase of some microscopes. Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, pleased to be before you again with another opportunity to provide uh, some improved uh, materials for our teachers. I'm here before you to present, a, um, present an information item for the purchase of advanced student and professional compound microscopes with seven inch digital microscope screens and uh, infinity plan laboratory compound microscopes with uh, touchscreen imaging systems. These microscopes will enhance the ability of our high school teachers to deliver high quality instruction to students using laboratory grade equipment. And we have received um, quotes from four different vendors. Um, this is an informational item uh, regarding funds that will be expended from ESSER 3. Alex, what questions do we have? Uh, let's start with Member Patricia, the Member Sutherland. How many microscopes are we looking to purchase? 
Well, we're looking to uh, provide microscopes for uh, Kettering, Mott, and uh, Durant. And we're looking at uh, providing 16 microscopes per teacher. So we have, uh, I didn't bring the total with me today. Sorry about that. 16 well, we. But it, it's, it's more than one. And again, Emory, they have screens? Yes, so they don't because have like a little dial and you have to try to look through that piece. Well, we do have go, that, but okay. we do to make it uh, easier for students to be able to look at the resolution. They have, uh, if, if you can, can kind of imagine, a, a little mini screen so you can get a better view of what is underneath the microscope. And uh, they are sometimes microscopes are attached to a computer, but these are not. So we have a miniature screen that's attached. I guess if Yes, things have uh, improved a little bit. They have. Member Sutherland, please. Um, actually, that was my question, the, where they were all going and how many we were purchasing. So that's uh -huh. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Colleagues, other questions? Okay, um, we are now going to move on to information item B um, and a Stepanski snapshot. Mrs. Sarah Davis. Good evening, board. Let me just pull up this PowerPoint here. There we go. Okay, there we go. So thanks for having me tonight here to present the April Stepanski snapshot. I am happy to report that over 100 staff and 300 preschoolers successfully made the move to the new Early Childhood Center over spring break. We want to give a huge thank you to Principal Bratton and all of her staff who helped to make that move a seamless transition for everyone involved. We'd also like to thank maintenance and operations as well as our information technology departments who did an incredible job overseeing the logistics of the move. Moving that many staff as well as nutrition and childcare services is a really big feat, but they were able to do so safely and efficiently. So we appreciate that. You'll recall that we held two soft openings. Uh, one was April 4th, one was April 5th, to give our main campus Stepanski families and staff a chance to see the new building before school started the following Monday. Each student received a Pete the Cat book, construction destruction, and inside the front cover was a QR code that linked to a video of Superintendent Lindbergh also reading the book. We hope that this will be a lasting memento for those families for many years to come. Now that the move is complete, we're finishing <coughs> up the rest of the exterior construction, which will continue through August 2024. Student and staff safety during this time is our number one priority, and there are several measures in place to ensure that this happens during construction. The entire campus will be ready for the first day of the 2024-25 school year. At that time, all of our pre-K students will finally be in one building as we're able to welcome our Liggett families to the new building as well. We believe that having everyone under one roof will lead to a more impactful and inclusive experience for both students and staff. So we're excited for that change. Lastly, this morning we held a photo shoot with four of our current Stepanski students in preparation for a new billboard we will be putting up in August. Um, advertising the new Early Childhood Center. So again, thank you to Principal Bratton for helping us to organize this along with those parents who were involved. I'd also like to thank Life Tracks, who was responsible for printing the shirts and their new print shop that they have going on there. So we will be back for more business for sure. It's not easy to get four preschoolers to smile for a photo at the same time, but I think we were able to do it, and I think that the new billboard is going to look really fantastic. So... That is it for my Stepanski snapshot for April. Any questions? 
Member Patricia, please. Is this something I, I thought about before? I forgot to ask anybody else. Is there a time capsule or anything? Do we know or are we looking for anything? Is, is there any? We don't believe there is one. We unearthed all of the time capsules that we know of two years ago now, and we had a time capsule museum of sorts at the Mott Kettering game, both physical and we have an online version of it. So we would have at that time had we known about one unearthed oh, it. We're not aware of one. Or the pillars or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not that we know of. It just it looks different with it all dark now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I look down there and it's dark. The new one's all shiny, but there's a big dark shadow. Other comments or questions here? Those? All right. Thank you. Thank yep. you. We are looking forward to September 14th. And big shout out to everyone who made that move happen over spring break, right, for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Colleagues, moving on now to information item C our Oakland School's budget resolutions. So really quick, colleagues, per the Michigan School Code, section 380.6242, the Oakland School's general fund budget must be presented to Oakland County's 28 school districts by May 1st of each year. Accordingly, this board has received the fiscal year 2024-2025 proposed budget documents. While not a statutory requirement, the Oakland Schools Board of Education is planning to hold a designees, designates minute meeting on Wednesday, May 1st at 6 p.m. at the Oakland Schools Administration Building, providing local board design, designates and district administrative staff an opportunity to hear a presentation on the budget and ask questions prior to finalizing a board resolution on or before June 1st. Member Sutherland is our representative and is invited to attend. And if unavailable, we will move um, to find, we'll have one of us serve as an alternate. Um, so a recommendation to approve a resolution in support or disapproval of the 2024-2025 proposed Oakland Schools General Fund budget will be presented for action on May 16th, 2024. Colleagues, any comments or questions? Member Johnson, please. I just want to thank Joan for doing that because I know that she'll stay on top of them. Uh, I don't really even want to see their budget this year. <laughs> I, I will definitely present I, back to the board and I'm planning to attend, so thank you. Yeah, I, I would like video of your questions, please. <laughs> we'll be on the front page of the open press. <laughs> <laughs> it might be like the fifth year in a row, Waterford Schools is like, we're having none of it. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Alex, any other comments or questions? I, I maybe will That's ask. Good. I think I think one thing to note, um, President Rissich and I had a conversation about this. There is a new superintendent for Oakland Schools, and so it feels like a really opportune time for us to use that to phrase the concerns and uh, areas where we're looking for more support um, in response to kind of creating a new chapter for our relationship with the Oakland Schools. So that's really the the, the way that we're going to be moving forward with this. So, more to come. And just for, for folks who are listening at home, um, we operate two center programs for, um, um, for our, our ISD, our Kingsley Montgomery, and our Children's Village School. And so, we play uh, an important role um, in helping them conduct their business. And um, as it often goes, uh, Lucy Miles reminded us that we all are here to serve each other, and so we would expect that relationship to be reciprocal. Um, and so we will make sure to have a conversation about what that looks like at another time. So. Okay. Colleagues, let's now move on to information item D, our newspaper notice, our notice of public hearing, and welcome up, please, Assistant Superintendent Elka. Thank you very much. As you noticed, we are now moving into budget season. And one of the first things that the state of Michigan requires us to do as a school district is to set a budget hearing date, which we have as June 20th, and then publish a notice in the paper. So you have in your packet the um, advertisement that we do every year, which just lets the community know when the hearing is. And at that hearing, what we do is present the next year's budget as well as next year's millage rates um, for the approval of the budget, or excuse me, approval of the board. And that is it. That one was pretty simple. 
Colleagues, any comments or questions regarding our um, uh, proposed public hearing in the newspaper? Member Sutherland, please. Uh, so the actual hearing will be on June 18th, correct, at that meeting? I believe it's June 20th. Is 20th, I think. I, yes. I know you said something that was late in June. Uh, I'm, I think we're comfortable with that. That only gives us, because by law, we have to have it passed by June yes. 30th. Um, is there any concern about not having it at the you know, first meeting in June? So at the first meeting, we will present it um, so the board has a chance to review it. This is the community's opportunity to take a look at it after the board has reviewed it, given any input they wanted, want and any changes they are requesting. So if you come to us at the first one in June and say we would like to make some changes, we will make that and then have that part of the official presentation in June where you'll go ahead and actually approve the board. The, the budget and the millage. Thank you. And uh, on uh, our next committee of the whole meeting, part of that conversation will be dedicated to our budget assumption. So we'll have to Correct. Um, I don't want to get your hopes too up because <laughs> uh, obviously you're aware that we haven't gotten much information from the legislature yet. So we will be presenting some of our um, our assumptions for the foundation allowance, being conservative, our enrollment projections, those kind of things that really do build up our budget. And we'll be talking about the expenditure budget as well and what we're looking at for that. It just won't be in as a depth as we would like. So having that first meeting in June will be very important because then we'll have more opportunity to go in depth and hopefully we'll have much more information. We are expecting after the May revenue consensus meeting that they will set their targets and then they will be able to approve something or at least get it to committee where we can then have that serious discussion about what they're looking at. Alex, other comments or questions? A uh, question. Um, June 20th, the date, um, so we have the public hearing. So let's say there's some reason we have to change something, which I didn't foresee, but uh, do we follow, is it normal OMA type thing where public notice, like we have to give the same notice or is there a lengthier notice? It, let's say we had to have a special meeting is what I'm saying, like a special budget meeting. Yes, I would recommend if we have to move the date for any reason that we would put another notice in the paper and let them know about it, yes. That would be the safest way to do it. And it's the same, uh, the same notice? That correct, it's the same notice, correct. But just like any time, if you approve the budget, you can always do a budget amendment at any time after. And that's and then that's one thing to remember that let's say we had it on June twentieth, and then we had another meeting June twenty eighth. You can approve another budget on June twenty eighth, even before we get to it. And of course, any time after that, you can approve a budget. So, it over over the many many years, so many different things have happened. So I've seen that before, where uh, budget was approved at the first meeting of June, and then a subsequent budget was approved in the second meeting um, that uh, changed the first one. So that is completely um, acceptable. Thank you. Alex, any other comments or questions? Sorry, I'm sorry just a quick, um, we haven't had a lot of conversation. I recognize we don't know the revenue side of the, because we're dependent on the state, so I understand that. From an expenditure side, will there be some detail available to us relative to any additions or subtractions that we intend on making at, the, at that point based on what we think the assumptions are? Yes, we would, we would have some information at that point um, because obviously we've already discussed about some of those changes that we'd be making. So especially with ESSER where we talked about permanent um, subs, um, permanent um, teacher subs and things like that, we'll be having conversations about that because we have found some additional funding for that from grants, so we'll have that conversation. So yes, we'll be able to talk about some of that extra funding and how we're using it and how we're helping that with our regular budget, yes. But also where we had ESSER funds that were supporting some of our, our uh, they were systemic things and not. Correct. We'll have some conversation about how we're going to sustain Correct. those or not. Correct. Thank you. Okay, anything else, colleagues? Okay, very good. Thank you both. Okay, um, I imagine we're going to keep both of you up here and we're going to talk a little bit about our professional audit services. Okay, this year we went ahead and put out an RFP for audit services and we have not bid that out since 2006. We thought it was a good time to do it. I'm going to have Amy talk a little bit about <coughs> why we do this when we really do not have to and then a little bit of the results from the bids. 
Okay, so um, the last time we bid out audit services, like Sandy said, was 2006. Um, we have had um, contract extensions, um, three-year contract extensions with our current, current auditors, um, Yo and Yo, um, since then. Um, the proposals, when we looked at them, we did receive five proposals, and you'll see there um, the different um, auditors that we um, received proposals for. Um, the proposals were evaluated with an emphasis on technical uh, qualities, cost, and other considerations, such as available resources, so meaning the number of auditors they have, um, number of school districts they've audited, even school districts that are um, around our size, which obviously we're a larger school district in the state, and um, involvement in school-related organizations. So organizations not only in, in their realm, so GASB organizations, different things like that, but organizations that we participate with. So, um, you know, MSBO, Michigan School Business Officials, um, ASBO, the, um, the association um, that is the... Um, the countrywide, um, and so we look at all those different things when we are looking at um, a proposal from the auditors. You'll see there um, they do have a little bit of a range, um, and that is um, you'll see um, that one of the lowest um, bidders is a very um, small um, auditing firm, and then the other four you'll see are, are pretty much within line with each other. Question, Jim? Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I appreciate you going out for bid on this because I know it has been quite some time. I, I wasn't yes. I, first time since I've been on the board actually that we've gone to bid this yep. out. Um, I, are you making a recommendation? Or are you still determining that at this time? Um, this is coming for information. We will be making our recommendation for action at the next meeting in May. Okay. And and the criteria. I, I imagine it's really difficult because you're you're choosing who's going to audit you. Correct. Who's going to be coming in and checking all the boxes. So yep. um, I imagine that's a really difficult task. I, I just, I, I recognize that Yo and Yo is the second highest. And like you said, there's hardly any difference. I just wasn't sure what your criteria is. How are you deciding who? We had, we had actually quite a, quite a list of criteria. Um, so like I talked about the number of, of staff, right. the quality of staff that are assigned to, um, that would be assigned to us. So we actually got resumes. From oh, the individuals okay, okay. that from the individuals that they would actually assign to us, um, the reputation of the firm within the state, um, the training that those individuals receive at their um, auditing firm, um, maintenance of a secondary partner in the engagement. So if they have another person that's you know partner level, um, internal control procedures and um, external quality control reviews. So they do get quality control reviews, and we had that in, in our packet too. Um, the ability to provide um, additional school-specific um, services to the district. So obviously, um, things such as um, your bond audit. Um, you know, there are things that um, districts go to their auditors for outside of just the financial statements in the, in the single audit report. Sometimes they go to them for um, additional help, you know, if, if there's a lot of turnover in their department, different things like that. So there was quite, quite a few recommend, or, uh, qualifications that we had within the um, request for uh, proposal. Thank you. That's, mm -hmm. It, it's a it's a really important thing I think for the board because it's the a set of outside eyes and it's important mm -hmm. for you folks as well because yes. it's a really big thing to get your arms around so I know that it's an incredibly important decision that you're making here and appreciate the fidelity that you're putting into it thank mm -hmm. you colleagues other comments or questions uh, for us, please. Yep. Um, so if uh, when we make a selection how, how long does the contract last this contract will be for five years. So it will start with this current year that will be audited. So this current year, meaning our fiscal year ending June 30th, 2024. Um, that will be audited in um, it, summer, late, uh, summer into fall. And then it will go through 2728, I believe. Let me double check. Yep, 2728. And then, um all these, these firms, and so they all have uh, more of a specialization in, in school districts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And so have other school districts used them or are they vouching yes. for them? Mm -hmm. okay. Yep, we, had, we got reference lists. Um, not only did we get reference lists, we got um, lists of all the school, district that the school districts that they audited. Is it standard practice to go with a five-year contract? I, I ask this because if you have them for, if you choose someone that you've never used before and you're unhappy with them, you have four more years of them. That seems like a big commitment for somebody that you might not have ever worked with before. Anytime you're doing a service, it's a little bit different. And we like to do a five-year contract to just have that little bit of stability <coughs> who we choose. But if we go in a year, and something changes. Let's say um, they have less staff than they used to. They can't service us. We can end the contract. The, it would be the same as any kind of other service one with assessments, attorneys, or anything. If something changes and they can't do the work or we are unhappy with their rework, we can end the contract. It's enough to say that you're unhappy that you don't have to show cause of some no. kind. Or... No. no. You I... just have to give them notice. Within, that's what's within the contract. I just feel like three years is a big commitment in this case, and as long as you guys feel comfortable with it, but I personally, if you're choosing someone new, I mean, just because you saw their resumes doesn't mean that person's gonna still work there come June, just, you know, or that Correct. they're gonna make them available, or, you know, there are so many things that can go into that, as you know, especially with the changing workforce, that a lot of transparency Correct. going on right now. And that is important. We needed to know who would be working on the audit, how, what their reputation is in the state. We want, auditing firms that have been around for a while and will be around for a while. So that was very important when we're looking at who their staffing is, who they have on their staff, how many they have, how many people they have come in, and how many districts they're doing. That helps us tell what kind of longevity they have. So yes, five years is a little bit longer, but three years is um, also maybe a little bit shorter because it seems like in a blink of the eye, three years goes by pretty fast. So five years gives a little bit of stability to both sides, but at the same time, um, and Amy can vouch for this, we're always looking at it year to year. Um, I've, had, I've been in situations where we went to the auditing firm and said we don't like the team, we don't think they're doing a good job, and they did a new team. Um, and that's what we can do. If they come and we're like, we really don't like this team, we don't think they're doing a good job, and as you pointed out, Amy and I, this is how we are judged and how we are graded, and we need to make sure we have the best outcome for the district because uh, the federal government looks at it, the state government looks at it, other granting organizations look at it, and if we do not have a good audit, regardless of what the result is, then there's not a lot of confidence from the people that are putting the money with us and we could potentially lose revenue sources. So for us, it's very important to get a firm that we believe is going to do a good audit and a thorough audit so that when people are looking at our financials, they're gonna be very sure about those numbers and have no doubt as to how well we do our jobs. Another question, um, and may I, maybe I missed this. So why are we, if we don't have to, uh, go out for bid, why are we? So a bidding process always allows the people that are bidding it to know that um, it is a sort of competitive thing. They, everybody, by putting it out on like BidNet where we put all of our bids, they, anybody could, could come in and bid on this. It, it evens the playing field and it doesn't make it appear like we're trying to pick and choose who we want to do work with. Because we could have gone to Yo and Yo, what we've done, and said, hey, we're just gonna do another contract. But we're like, let's see what's out there, let's see who's out there, let's see who's interested in us as a district, let's take a look at their qualifications. And that means that when we pick a um, company for you to approve, we have a lot of confidence in that. Now let's say we had some come in and we didn't like any of them, we would rebid, or we would say, okay, we're gonna reach out to those that we know are already very good in our state, work with um, education, and is someone that we would have confidence in, and we would, pick, we would go and pick to them and ask them to bid. But by doing this, it allows us to have an open playing field, and anybody who's interested can apply. And it allows us to, um, with, to see competitive pricing. <clears throat> so we have been with Yo and Yo for a number of years, and we've, they've had increases throughout those years. This allows us to see what the, to make sure that that those increases are competitively um, increased each year. So then, when we renewed their contract, then so they had a five year, and then we just kept renewing the five years essentially. 
we had, that needed to do the art. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know years. if their original was five years because I wasn't I here. I think we were doing three. Yeah. But every every um, every um, time period after that, it's been a three year renewal. So I don't know what the original was in 2006. But. Okay. Excellent. Um, I'm just. I'm, this is a, an unusual situation because you're essentially hiring, it's not your boss, I know, but you are hiring your own oversight. And the oversight is really for the community and for the board. So the more information I think that we can understand about when you come forward with a recommendation, mm -hmm. I think it's really important for the board to recognize why you wanted someone different if it's someone different or the same person if it's the same person, mm -hmm. so that we understand maybe we're because you're, again, you're choosing your own oversight here, and mm -hmm. that is on behalf of the board and the community for taxpayer dollars. So um, I think more information about w once you make a selection and why would be very helpful. And we, we do intend to do that, because we're, when we do our due diligence, we're linking the same thing. Um, we're going through our criteria, and we're basically deciding who fits that criteria the best. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Let's keep both of you up here and let's talk about the IA Okemo budget, please. Thank you very much. So we are part of a consortium that allows our students to participate in an international baccalaureate program. Um, Waterford is part of the central campus, which is located on Bloomfield Hills property and is considered the IA Okma campus. Um, we have currently 37 students in there and we have 60 places that we can go ahead and use. We have um, attached to your packet, you can see the update for the 23-24 year. Um, we had the revenue go up uh, slightly and the, and the expenditures go down slightly so that they're trying to end with a slight positive number on that. There is one change and you'll notice that because it looks a little bit different when you look at the actual from the prior year is that we have a reclassification of salary and benefits down to the payments to other school districts. So one of the things with the consortium when it was set up is it allowed employees from any of the participating districts to work as teachers in the IA at any of the campuses. And what, what they do is they remain employees of their home district. So if we had a teacher here at Waterford, and we've had in the past, who wanted to work with the IA campus, they would apply for one of those positions, and if they got it, they would remain a Waterford employee, and they would be subject to our union contracts. So uh, what um, they looked at is they looked at how that was um, presented, and in the past, it's just been put in with salaries and benefits. Um, but the correct classification really is payment, because what they do is those payments go out to those school districts. So, for example, we do have, I still, still think, one person at the IA West campus who is our employee. We bill the IA West campus and we get reimbursed for that. So um, they show up in here and then we get money that, is it offset or is it revenue? I can't remember. No, it's a, a, a transfer. Okay, it's a transfer in. So, so that it nets our expenditures down um, so it doesn't show up in our expenditures, but it will show up in the IA West. So... That is just one of those things that's a reclass, but what we're looking at is for next year is just a 3% um, increase in salaries and wages. Um, they also are, um, Lynn, if you remember, Lynn um, Burton, or Gibson, excuse me, used to be the, um, or is the principals there. They had split that between the three campuses. They're bringing that back because each of the other campuses have their own principal now. So they're not splitting a principal. So you'll see that slight increase as well. And then um, we have a increase to the um, foundation. What it is is they take our foundation and they add an 8.5% increase and that's the tuition that we pay for each of our students who attend there. We do have the FTE recognized in district, but then we pay tuition to the campus. So at the next board meeting, we'll ask the um, board to approve the budget if it's okay. Um, they do say if you do not approve the budget, then that is the notice that you'll be out of the consortium next year. <laughs> That's great. <coughs> Alex, comments, questions regarding the IA Oklahoma budget? Another question. Number Torres, please. So uh, you said they add 8.5%. 
Yes, so what they look at is they look at everybody's foundation and then go ahead and add 8.5% to get to the tuition. Now, let's say that tuition was more than they needed, they can reduce that. Last year, I think it was 10%, so they did reduce it to 8.5% of the foundation. And the idea is all of the, all of the districts that are involved have slightly different um, foundation levels, so this is a way to, in essence, make it fair without um, having to overburden the ones that have a lower foundation or um, charge more to the, uh, the ones that have a higher foundation. And then we have 37 students, but we have 60 seats. But Correct. So we only pay for 37? We only pay for the ones that actually attend. So, um, in, so the IA, that's the Bloomfield one, right? Correct. The IA Okma campus is on the Bloomfield Hills um, I think district. That, that's one of the like, top 10 best Yes. High schools academically in the country. Yes, yes. This is the, the IA campuses usually get highly rated, yes. They, they teach the International Baccalaureate program. Correct. Yeah, so, yeah, that's a, that's a really good opportunity. For yes, it, for those students who are interested in it, it is a great opportunity. Yes. But it costs us 8.5% more per student. Correct. But remember, they are paying for all the consumables, they are paying for computers, they're paying for all of those things as well that we would be paying in district um, for our students. And how many? Oh, wait. Okay, good. Thank you. Other questions, comments, or comments? I think that's the first time I've heard the OKMA. Uh, is, what does that stand for? Is it Oakland? It's Bert Oakma was the first one, that first principal of the IA program when it was first done. So when he retired, they honored him by renaming the central campus after him. Oh, thank you. That was an acronym. When I was like, yeah. That. Yeah, I think a lot of people always thought it was, but um, when I started at HBS, we were part of that consortium at IA West, so I'm far more knowledgeable than most people about this whole, mm -hmm. whole history. So yes, I, I, I knew Bert, and I know Lynn, and... You know, they've always done a wonderful job for this program. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Colleagues, let's now move on to an ESSER update, please. Let me start it. So. Would you have a, a, you have a presentation in front of you? Correct. Correct. We have a presentation in front of you that we will talk about. This is something that, as part of ESSER 3 requirements from the federal government, we are required every six months to get an update to the board and the community about how we're using our funds and whether we have made any changes in how we're using those funds, which we have not. But at this time, we also like to give you an update of how we spend our money. And so Amy's going to go into a little bit more detail with that. Okay. Um, so the first... Oh, we're not going to go. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the first slide here, um, the last time we gave you an update was in October. So the first slide here is of ESSER 2. Again, ESSER 2 is completely expended. Um, it had to be um, completely expended by 930 of 2023. So these are the same numbers that you've seen for um, ESSER 2 um, from, from October. And it's done, done, done. Done, done, done. done, done. Yep. Yep, it was expended and um, reported to the state of Michigan. The next um, slide you'll see here is ESSER 3. Um, we've talked about it several times. So again, ESSER 3 is 10, just over $10 million. Um, we have uh, spent, encumbered, and allocated approximately 8.9. Um, you will see that there is available of a, um, just over a million dollars left. Um, so some of the things that, um, you know, for instance, tonight that you got an information item on of um, the microscopes, um, that would also, that would be part of that $1 million. Um, you also have um, an item that you are um, voting on. Um, this evening, and that would also be part of that million dollars. And then that million dollars, now that we are coming to the end, we only have approximately five more months left of ESSER uh, 3, because ESSER 3 needs to be spent by September 30, 2024. Okay, so um, with that coming to an end in only about five more months, that $1 million will be allocated to some of the other areas that um, maybe we need a little bit more money in, um, so um, we need to increase the budget on those areas. So again, you'll see the areas that we've talked about. Remember, ESSER 3 does have um, a 20% um, uh, uh, um, 
re, um, what's the word I'm looking? Requirement, thank you. Um, requirement um, to address learning loss. So out of that $10 million, 20% of it, or um, just over $2 million, needs to be um, uh, used to address learning loss. Okay, and so there are a lot of things in here that we could actually put to address learning loss. Um, these are the ones that we specifically put to it. Um, so we're talking about the ELA curriculum. We're talking about into literature and um, the e so into literature is the um, secondary level, and then into reading is the elementary level. Um, we're talking about the programs that we've talked about a lot over the last couple of years. Um, those are really cool programs that some of them. In include AI and you know know exactly where your student is in their learning. Lexia, Success Maker, Power Up, Dreambox, and also Camp WSD. Camp WSD, we are expanding on this summer and including middle school. Um, so you will see there um, we've spent approximately two point, almost $2.4 million there and also have encumbered and allocated another 931,000. That is for the summer school that we plan on doing this year, um, 2020, well, it will, it will start in um, the end of 23, 24 and continue on into 24, 25. Um, it will also include the 24, 25 um, uh, licenses and remaining years of curriculum for, the, for what I talked about of um, ELA. Um, the next area is provide school leaders resources to address needs. This is the um, nurse, that, multiple nurses at one point that we had. Um, currently we have one. Um, the math curriculum, Spanish curriculum, science materials, the science consultant, um, science uh, books, um, uh, and that is just under a million dollars, $973,000, with um, encumbered and allocated another 554. Um, that is the remainder of the science kits that we still are putting together um, with elementary and um, materials that we are still buying for um, middle school and high school, like one of the things you heard about today, um, and also includes the curriculum um, that we talked about, like math, um, that would be um, continuing on into 24-25. Um, it also does include some summer work um, for the nurse that we currently have which is outside of her contract that she has for the school year. Um, then you'll see we talk about continuity, uh, continuity of services and maintenance and operations, uh, permanent guest teachers and DMBER um, incentives. Um, really the remainder there is the um, permanent guest teachers. Um, that will be, that is currently for this year two at um, every elementary and uh, middle school and three at the high school. Um, implementing evidence-based activities, that was DEI, um, uh, PD, curriculum PD, uh, PBL leaders, ELA and math leaders, so a lot of um, extra duty um, stipends there for those types of things. And you'll see there, there was about just under uh, $400,000 with another 18,000 left. That's the last quarter of DEI. We also do have mental uh, health supports. That is the safe behavior interventionist. Um, you'll see there that in this grant there wasn't um, anything expended there. That's because we've had other grants that we have moved those um, safe behaviorists to. Um, so I do have budgeted 350,000 there, um, but we do have um, other areas that we can charge them, such as 31 AA, and um, they can also be moved back to um, their original funding source, which is 31 A, or at risks as another. I know all these numbers start to, if I can't get them straight, I don't know. Um, purchase of educational technology. These are things like the Chromebooks, Google Workspace, Illuminate, um, calculators. We have um, approximately 44,000 um, there for encumbered and allocated. Um, that's for additional headphones. Um, for elementary and um, middle school. Um, and so those headphones allow those students to use those Chromebooks and not be, you know, um, interfering with everyone else in the classroom. And allows them to also do testing too. Um, and then we talk about um, purchasing supplies, sanitation, indoor, and um, indoor air quality. That's all those um, PPE items, the wipes, the sanitizers, the MERV filters, the um, instrument covers that we bought 
and all those kinds of things. So you'll see there that there's not anything encumbered. I do need to move some of that million dollars um, there for that. But again, we've really reduced those costs as the years have gone on since 2020. Okay, so currently in the spent to date, you'll see it's just over $6 million, and in the encumbered allocated is just under $3 million, and that leaves that million um, in available to expend. So the next slide is just, again, a reiteration of what we talked about, that SR2 was completely spent. It was... Um, uh, spent and um, reported to the state of Michigan as of 9-30-2023. Um, SR3, we always um, knew we were going to go right up until 9-30 of 2024 because we did want to use that opportunity to put in 24-25 curriculum at the beginning of that year. Um, so that was always our goal date of that. And um, again, it um, needs to be spent as of 9-30-2024. And we are on target. Um, I have been in contact with um, Kevin Walters up at the state of Michigan, um, giving him assurances of where we're at, what we're looking at, and the different things that um, we plan to um, use the money for from this point through 9-30. Alex, what questions do we have on our ESSER update? Sutherland, please. Um, thank you for this, um, both reports. We're so happy to have ESSER 2 you know, wrapped up, because I know, especially in your <laughs> world, that makes it so incredibly complicated. Um, with only 60% of the money of that $10 million being spent already, I recognize that we have uh, 3 million, about a little shy of 3 million allocated to be spent in all of the things that you talked through, mm -hmm. and another 1 million on top of that so we still have 40% of this to spend with only a few months remaining prior to the cutoff date. Mm -hmm. I, I love all the things that you have allocated and mm -hmm. you know, and encumbered and allocated, but do you have visions for that last million? And mm -hmm. I, I mean, yes, it, and it's, yep. Okay. So um, as of, it just <laughs> makes me nervous. It makes me nervous. We have 40% of the money no, we haven't yeah, spent yet. No, nope, not, not, I, not to be nervous, not to be nervous. No, I don't want to so lose there, it. Nope. So there are things. So for instance, those um, in, in this $6 million that is on here, because this, I had this as of um, March 31st, in that $6 million, there are things that um, are always charged at the end of the year. So for instance, what I talked about, about those guest, um, those guest teachers, two at the elementaries and the middles and the, and three at um, the high schools. That is just over a million dollars, about a million uh, 36,000 um, for those individuals. So that will be in 630. It just hasn't been charged as of yet because we wait until the end of the school year and know what all those costs are and then we move it. Um, so there's that. There is um, approximately half a million in um, summer school. And then there is things that are coming up on the agenda, um, such as tonight, the algebra and geometry. That is almost $200,000 um, for um, just the ESSER piece. Um, then there is also um, coming up in May, um, a social studies curriculum. TCI, um, that's another three over three hundred thousand um, dollars. So those those right there, um, those couple things that I talked about is over two million dollars. Then we have the things that we talked about that we would charge for 24-25 school year, and those will be charged in the new school in the new fiscal oh, year starting July, August. September. Correct. Yes. Starting July first. <laughs> Um, there's, you know, there's the licensing for Dreambox. Um, there's um, all kinds of uh, the other pieces to all of those curriculums that we talked about. So um, the ELA curriculum, the math curriculum, the Spanish, the um, the uh, um, what's the other one um, that I'm thinking of? Um, the science. All of those curriculums, there's a piece to them, right? Because a lot of them, remember, were six years, right? So there was a piece to them that will be charged for the 24-25 school year. Right. Yep. So I've gone through all of them, and and um, I was a little concerned at first, 
But um, once I went through it and went through every single piece to it, I, like I said, I've, I've, um, I've told Kevin up at the state because he also has reached out to anyone that in the same, thinking the same as you, Joan, that, okay, wait a minute, you have this much, you've only spent this, what are you doing with it? Because obviously we don't want to send any money back. So I've given him reasonable assurance that we don't plan on sending any money back. We also have, um, which will be budgeted um, indirect with this grant, and that's 2.88%. So you can charge indirect for all of those things, such as my time, um, that are not necessarily pinpointed directly to the grant with direct charges. And that right there alone is almost $300,000, $288,000. Thank you very much. I, I assumed as much, but it's just is such a big number yep. right now. So um, the other piece is something that I know I've been saying since ESSER first mm -hmm. came out of our mouths yep. the first yep. time. There is... There is a, a good port, not a, a good portion of this is one-time money, okay. but there is a still a very big numbers in here that are um, systemic costs that we're going to have to keep covering or we're going to have to cut. I know that we've added some of those systemic costs with our curriculum, where we have mm -hmm. to buy, you know, we're, we're licensing it. Mm -hmm. We have to continue to buy the hard copies, the, mm -hmm. the pieces of it that you know. And, and I know we've, we're paying what we can, and mm -hmm. but we're still going to have those continued costs. Those are the kinds of things that when we go to review the budget, I, I think it's really important that we understand because we're winding down ESSER in mm -hmm. September. So our next the budget that we approve has to either pick those things up or not. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of other funding sources too. So right. when we I, I talk know. about 31AA, when we talk about um, 98C has transitioned into 23G. So there's a lot of right. other um, funding sources out there too that, that but we're using we will those be talking about. Sources Right now, presumably in a different way. Uh, uh, mm. Well, for instance, for instance, we have increases in some. Right. That's that's yeah. where we. And go. for instance, summer yeah. school. Summer yeah. school. Um, we're going to put as much as we can, obviously, because we want to spend this um, as of 9 30, 2024. So that's why you. When I say I have budgeted in here a half a million for summer school, that's why, because I right. want to make sure this is spent. Right. But 23 G goes all the way out until 9 30 of 2026, and that's for summer school and before and after school. Okay. Okay, I, and that's I just, what we're seeing with some of these grants mm -hmm. is that they're going out a couple more years. Yeah. So that gives us a couple more years before we have to worry about putting it back in the general fund. Okay. And there's always a chance we're going to get even more grants at that time. Is there is there a summary of those that I might be able to find somewhere? I mean, um, I mean just of how yeah, much so, and how long we, they go. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to make work for anybody, but we're, if I can look just, online. Those are state grants, aren't they? Yeah, like that's state state we're, just, we're, the we're just laughing. At our level? Yeah. We're just laughing because because normally we have 20 new categoricals in a state budget. This right. year we had 149. Oh, wow. Okay. So we've been working through and identifying any that we can apply for, and we make sure that we have it. It doesn't mean that we have to spend it this year, and luckily we usually have a couple years to spend it, but it's just... It's we're we're really struggling trying to keep I, track I totally of it and get everything. It. Bless your hearts, so, both of you, I, um, and your whole teams, because I, I do understand that it's a very but, difficult, changing world, and that creates a whole bunch of new buckets. And we're and this moving one, out of an ESSER yes. world, and we're moving into, and we've got some overlap, and we've got some restrictions on each one of those buckets. And what can you put? And what can't you? When do they die? And off? I would love to so, do something in the next um, couple of board meetings when we're doing some of the budget. We can bring up some of the ones that we are using right now. And so, I mean, like the 27K, it doesn't affect us directly, but it is a benefit to our employees, and it's been a lot of work. It would be nice to talk about some of those things. That one, that grant is the one where we are getting reimbursement to our employees who have student loans. And so, you know, some of these things may not direct us, may not impact us directly, but they do impact our employees, and it, it's certainly a, a win for them. But yes, I would love to add some things to that, and we certainly can go ahead and include a bunch that we've already applied for, and we can indicate if we've used them, how much they are, um, how long we have to use them, so that you have a feel for They're really what just pass-throughs in that instance. I mean, we, we get the money, and then the teachers get it. Right. That, that particular one is a pass-through, yes. But there are plenty that, like Amy was talking about, that um, we have the opportunity to use it for this summer, next summer, the next right. couple of years. And because it's state money, it's, it's considered work project, so we can have it for a couple of years. I'm, I, I definitely do not want to make work for you, and I recognize how many new categoricals there are. My, uh, just to get down to a very basic level, my big concern is things that we have added into yes. a budget that are structural in nature. Correct. 
that we have to know how to pay for because we didn't used to have those and yes. now we do. And those yes. are the things with the grants, the ESSER money is running out. You know, what are we going to do Correct. to cover those costs Correct. or not have those programs? And, and that is one of the things we're looking at every time we get these new grants from the state. We're looking at what are those systemic costs in ESSER that um, we want to find other funding sources for. And we've been very successful even at the county level. Um, uh, Assistant Superintendent Eldridge found one at the county level that helped pay for the safe team for two years. That is huge so huge, nice. that means that's that's money in our 31a that we can set aside and use in future years um, so there's just things like that so that is one of the things we're always sort of keeping an eye on every time a grant comes out we are taking that advantage of what do we what can, what are we paying for now that we can put in that grant and give us a little bit more um, leeway in each year's budget number Wagner please I just had one quick question. That was what I was going to ask you because I know like with the mental health supports, our safe team, we have encumbered allocated 350,000, but we also know that the governor has put in her budget that she wants to maintain that with the 31 AA with over 300 million to go to the school so we can maintain this. So what would happen to that 350,000? Would we be able, do we have to allocate that somewhere else by September 30th? Okay, but that would, hopefully that's something we'll yeah. know by May, if she's able to get that piece of it passed. It sounds like that, that piece is most likely going to be one of the ones that's passed, so. Yes. Okay, that was just my other question. Thank you. Um, as uh, Trustee Sutherland said about the, um, one of my concerns is our budget this coming year and the addressing of the learning loss. So we spent a lot of money with Alexia mm -hmm. and the curriculum mm -hmm. and all the additions and then we also have the, the educational technology which kind of goes hand in hand with that, the Chromebooks and those kinds of things. We have the money allocated. It looks like what you're saying we'll make that date of the 930 commitment, the 1231, mm -hmm. have it spent. Um, as we move into the next fiscal year, plugging that up, but then we're looking at grants at the state level, the 120, you, you're saying, items that could be available, which could be complicated, but those, you know, um, that, that's good. We'll, we'll, we'll have that money. So that makes me feel better because I, I, I am concerned about the learning loss. Yes. Um, it is a real thing. Mm -hmm. I think we all see it uh, in communities all across the, the country, but uh, particularly, you know, students, you know, that are uh, that are regular economic and then low socioeconomic, it's even worse. Uh, so, and you know, that's something definitely we want to address with our students. And there's been a lot of innovations and things that are happening, so I think that's great. Um, but I'm really focused on that budget and making sure that we are filling those learning losses um, in some way and then having the technologies available for the students. Um, the ESSER funds, so we had the, the 10 million and then the ESSER two, we had the four and a half million essentially. And then how much was the ESSER one? It was about a million. Okay, so. But there was also other things within that. There was gear, there was um, the Oakland County um, ESSER funds that we received. There was many pieces to that first round. I, if, I want, if I'm remembering correctly, try not to remember it. Um, there was six of them. So, so we've gotten a substantial amount over there. Three years. Yes. So. Yes. Um, the the Camp WSD is, is what is that? Summer school. Is that, that is summer yeah. school. Yeah, yeah, okay. Summer school. I had it written down, so I wasn't sure if it was summer school. So that that's what that is. So how does that work? Summer school? Do they? Is it like it used to be, where they actually go to school, or is it a virtual thing? I don't do summer school, so I would have to defer to. <laughs> I'm just interested because I know that summer school students lose a lot of learning um, in the off years. So I feel like that's an opportunity for our kids, mm -hmm. especially the ones that are behind, yep. you know, to, to get in there and to, you know, build up so that when they come in next year, they're strong. Right. Camp WSD is our elementary program. It is targeted towards students who have significant um, gaps in their achievement. And it does focus on um, math and ELA in a very hands-on way. We've made it a very expansive program over the last few years and targeted um, EL students and um, students who have some deficits in terms of getting them 
um, back on track. And at the beginning of the year, I think this year, um, we did some data on how well that worked. And um, the team who runs w Camp WSD was able to share that it's been pretty successful. Um, we implemented or are implementing, we've implemented a middle school program, but we're really solidifying it this year. And the high school program is a credit recovery type program for students who are lacking credit. We also have our Summer of STEAM program, which is camps um, surrounding the STEAM technology um, and those are the ones that parents pay for, right? The steam ones. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. I think I got my daughter enrolled in my way. Yeah. Those. She'll love yeah. it. <laughs> but um, so for the, that's good to hear it. So the elementary one is then, is that like a virtual or is it like a oh, hybrid? Oh, no, it's in person. It's, in person. it's um, yes. how, how do the, the kids? The school is running. It's great to see. You should stop by this summer if you They get referred or? And, yes, and they get the referred. Sign off and and um, yeah. Yeah, we provide transportation, food. Um, it's it's a really very cool experience, and we'll keep you informed of the dates. And we love to have visitors. And the high school's credit recovery, so that's yes. more virtual based. Um, actually, students can come into the lab to attend and. Um, we encourage that because the kids tend to do better when there is a teacher helping and there for support as well. Um, but some students do or are allowed to do it virtually if they need to. And there's nothing right now for the middle school, you said? There has been some stuff for the middle school, but we're really focusing on it this year and we're really expanding the program this year for middle school. Yes. Thank you. Sure. I just... Thank you guys so much for doing this. I'm sure that you and your team go to bed at night and <laughs> you can't wait for the day that Esser and the Bond are closed out and you can just do what you're normally supposed to do. So I only have one question, it's probably for everybody here. Is there anything that we have not updated curriculum wise in this district that needs to be updated? Yes, and we're working on that. Yes. Are we gonna be, are we gonna be done soon? or close, we will have everything updated here quick. Okay, that's, you know, I mean, that was a huge chunk of money and that's, you know, that's the main reason that we're all here and I just wanna make sure that everything is updated, nothing's outdated and that when we're moving money around that that's one of our primary focuses is that everything is updated. Okay, perfect, thank you. So maybe just to synthesize, again, I think it's, these ESSER awards have allowed us to dramatically reshape and refashion the student experience here in the WSD. And um, we're so thankful as you begin to sort of make sure that these things are sustained, right? Because, I mean, these, this has been revolutionary work uh, and that as we continue to look for new ways to fund this. So um, uh, kudos to you for administering this and finding ways to sustain this uh, and to keep those, all this good work going. It's amazing. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Okay, colleagues, we're now done with information items tonight. Let's move on, please, to new business. And let's turn it over, please, to Secretary Torres. Uh, thank you. Superintendent's uh, recommendations, 6723-24, resolution, National Teacher Appreciation Week. Whereas, through their dedicated efforts to ensure our children learn the knowledge and skills needed to be successful in college, careers, and life, Teachers are vital in building the future, and whereas teachers must be uh, constantly learning so they may adapt to meet the ever-changing needs of young people in our schools, and whereas teachers play a crucial role in shaping our children into the people they will become, supporting them through their youth and teaching lessons that have an impact on students they will carry through life, and whereas the teaching profession benefits from educators who are empowered to lead within and beyond the classroom, allowing them to best prepare young people to become contributing members of our community, thereby strengthening our democracy. And whereas all the dedicated educators working in Waterford School District put in countless hours and extra effort to help students achieve, preparing them for, for further education of the workforce and their civic duties. There, Therefore, be it resolved that the Waterford Board of Education does hereby proclaim May 6th through the 10th, 2024, as Teacher Appreciation Week, 
a time to recognize those who are becoming tomorrow's teachers and to thank the many teachers whose commitment makes us makes a difference in the lives of the children in the Waterford School District. I so move. Support. Thank you, colleagues. Moved and supported emphatically. What comments or questions do we have? We have a, you know, happy National Teacher Appreciation Week. It's, I, there's not a teacher around that hasn't touched somebody's life somehow, somewhere. It's so exciting to be at Kroger or someplace when you see a teacher that you had or even my kids who are like, oh, school, whatever, and then they see a teacher and you can just see the sparkle in their eyes or I know when we were at Stepansky, one of the teachers recognized me. She goes, I know I had one of your kids. And, you know, you guys are amazing individuals and some days your job is easy, some days it's hard, but thank you so much for what you do for our kids. Member Patricia, please. Um, this is for a, a appreciation week, but we appreciate them all the time. Because sometimes we have appreciations for a month, appreciation for a week, appreciation day. Who determines that? Who's in charge of that part? <laughs> but because again, I'm just because we do have ones that we celebrate for a month, we celebrate for a week. We celebrate them all the time. We make a commitment to say, hey, thank you very much. But it, I hate putting a, a time on it. Just want to celebrate them and continue to celebrate them. Not for a day, a week, or a month. So that's just my two cents. Member Donahue, please. Yeah, just a thank you. So well deserved. Um, although it's only for one week where we really do this uh, resolution, but it's, uh, it's well deserved all year long. I had the opportunity, I was in Florida a few weeks ago, and um, uh, where we were staying at. And this lady walked by me, and it, she looked familiar. And it, it really started, it really bothered me. And a couple days in a row, I saw her there, and it finally hit me. And it was actually one of my previous high school teachers. Um, and uh, when I rec when I realized that, I went up to her and talked to her for quite a while. And and um, she was, we all, we both got teary eyed um, as as. Uh, it was very nice, and she said that uh, for someone to still recognize her and, and come up and thank her and appreciate her for everything that she does. And uh, um, so, yeah, it's it, it's just that was just a very nice moment with that. But for all the teachers uh, and the staff in the in the districts, uh, thank you so much. And nine weeks, countdown's on nine weeks. So. <laughs> Member Torres, please. I just wanted to put in my two bits too. Uh, just. Having a child in elementary school, you see how much they respect and really love their teachers. They come home, they have such an impression on them. Um, when my daughter comes home, she tells me what she's learned and, and what's happened. And it's, it's pretty unique for me because last year, my daughter, she had um, the same teacher that my older daughter had in 2006. So here it was, you know, you're talking 19, uh, you know, 18 years later, um, you know, the little one has the older one is her teacher, or has the little one had the same teacher that the older one had. Um, and it's just great to see that, you know, they still have that passion, still have that impact on her. Um, we even invited, you know, my daughter, her elementary school teachers at Cooley, several of them have come to her graduations, my older one. Um, so I, I, you just think of the impact that, that they have. Uh, and she is still friends with them. She says she goes on Facebook only for her parents, you know, her parents, you know, the old people, you know, and that's her teachers and her parents and things like that. Um, but uh, they do, they have such an impact and, and they, they can really, you know, do a lot for, a, a, you know, a child and, and their education. And I know I see it every day. And I think probably one of the most uh, prominent examples that we saw of that was this past week with the eclipse. You saw all the pictures, you know, online. Uh, my daughter's teachers sent the class dojo photos and videos of them, you know, going out and learning and, and looking, you know, at the eclipse and learning about not just, you know, watching it, but learning what's behind it and teaching me a few things about it when she came home. So I think that's just an awesome opportunity that our teachers have and continue to support them and the things that we do and the decisions that we make every day. Thank you. Member Sutherland, please. I, I agree with that everything my colleagues have said and uh, is so beautifully said. Uh, I just wanted to kind of add to that by saying, I think the reason that we have this uh, Teacher Appreciation Week is 
because yes, we always appreciate our teachers. They are the, at the heart of everything that the Waterford School District does. Um, but when you time box it to a week, I think the idea is that you that you do some that you make a concerted effort. It's a precision focus opportunity to write that letter to that teacher. And I don't even mean just our kids. I mean our parents, maybe to their teachers, to the teachers that impacted their lives. Um, but but hopefully you take a minute to put pen to paper. I know old school. Let me just say email, post, something to thank your your teachers, to thank the people who have shaped you and and to have that heart of gratitude because um, we as a society, you know what, there's a great thing in this resolution that says, thereby strengthening our democracy. That is why we have public education. That is why we as a nation started public education was to ensure that we had an informed electorate and that it's a level, it, be, it creates a level playing field for all people to have those opportunities. I think it's just a really beautiful resolution. And so we, we wanna make sure that we support that in everything that we do. Um, you know, write that letter to the, to the, with that heart of gratitude for, for the people that have changed their lives. Well, what I was starting to say is that we as a nation have not supported public education because there's another line in here that has been added since I've been on the board that says, a time to recognize those who are becoming tomorrow's teachers. I do not believe that used to be part of our resolution, but now we have not valued our teachers. We have not put our money where our mouth is as a society. I don't mean the Waterford School District, please, if anybody's tuning in now. I, I mean, we as a society, we don't, we don't value the teachers as a profession in the way that many of our, our European countries might do in a way that says, we value you and here's, here's how you know it because here's what we're, we're putting forth as a nation to show you. And so we can't find teachers in some, school, in some places, in some schools, in some areas of education. And, and that's because we haven't put our money where our mouth is. And so um, I think, you know, we, this is another opportunity for us to say, where would we be as a nation if we didn't have our magic teachers, the people that change the lives of our children because they are our future. I know it sounds like a Whitney Houston song, but it's true. I mean, it's just so true. They're the ones who are gonna take care of us. They're the ones that we're turning everything over to. So we, we should be investing in them heartily. And, and I, I'm grateful that we are, so grateful that we are. So anyway, appreciate everything that they do, always, always, always and forever. And, Take some time to uh, send that email, write that note, you know, make, make that gesture so that uh, teachers feel the gratitude that I know that you feel for them. Thank you. And, and just to, to wrap it up and to build off what all of our, my colleagues up here have said, uh, so much of what we just went over in, in our ESSER update are things that our teachers have had to take on. And we have asked them to take on a lot. Um, uh, and they have done so with, um, with great success. At our last meeting, we have our students in Waterford are almost learning double time. So we're not just learning a year's worth of content, we're nearly learning two years of content in one year. Um, and that's thanks to our teachers. Some of our schools, 99% of our students are hitting their growth target goals. I mean, if, if, we, if we put this teacher appreciation resolution in that context, um, We've got some of the best around, and uh, we are so, so happy to support this um, and so thankful for our teachers. And our students are learning two years' worth of lessons in one year, 99% hitting their lessons, um, and that is thanks to all that our teachers have, have taken on and done so successfully. So we are more than happy to support this. Colleagues, all those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Motion carries seven. Secretary Torres. Uh, Superintendent's recommendation 6823-24, resolution Administrative Professionals Day. Whereas administrative professionals play an essential role in coordinating the office operations in schools and departments throughout the Waterford School District, efficiently handling day-to-day -day routines that keep our district running smoothly. And whereas the work of administrative professionals today requires advanced knowledge and expertise in communications, computer software, office technology, project management, organization, custom service, and other vital office management responsibilities. And whereas administrative professionals are critical public relations ambassadors representing the face of our schools and district, the thousands of parents, community members, and students who walk in the door or call on the telephone. And whereas every day in the Waterford School District, administrative professionals work behind the scenes to ensure bills are paid 
student employee attendance is tracked, repairs are scheduled, questions are answered, payroll is processed, and a host of other critical functions are fulfilled. And whereas we commend the expertise and dedication of the district's administrative professionals, their commitment to teamwork, and their willingness to learn and accept new challenges and opportunities. Now, therefore, it be proclaimed that the members of the Waterford Board of Education express appreciation to our administrative professionals for all they do to support our students and schools and hereby join the rest of the nation in celebrating April 24th, 2024 as Administrative Professionals Day. I so move. Support. Thank you. It's important motion has been moved and supported. Colleagues, what comments or questions do we have, please? Member Wagner. Well, we are very grateful to have the best administrative support and Ms. Megan Roberts, who's smiling as she's typing. So, but thank you, not only to our teachers, but to all of our staff, especially those that run our offices and make sure, because they are the front lines and we are very lucky to have some amazing people in our district and our staff is, is pretty wonderful. So thank you to all of you. Member Donahue, please. Everything that Ms. Wagner said, we couldn't do it without you. We know who runs those offices, and uh, um, thank you very much for everything that you do. Thank you, Megan. Um, thank you for all that you do. I texted her today about something to help me with, so uh, she really comes through, I think, for this board and all the administrative professionals in our schools. More than a day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. All year. Thank you, well Megan. Said. You know that. She's talked me off the ledge many times. And Megan, thank you for talking Rob off a ledge many times. Well, not really. Sometimes she's thinking, jump! <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. And to our own Megan Roberts, honestly. Um, there's, there's oftentimes, if I have to call the superintendent, uh, I either know that I'm going to start with Megan or I'm going to end up at Megan. So, um, thank you. Sometimes <laughs> both. Sometimes both. That's right. That's more often than not. Yeah. All right, colleagues, all those in favor of this motion, please signify by raising your hand. Thank you, motion carries 7-0. Thank you to our amazing administrative professionals. All right, Secretary Torres, please. Superintendent's recommendation 69-23-24, Stepanski ECC drainage easement. It is recommended that the Board of Education approve a stormwater drainage easement for the Road Commission of Oakland County, RC, OC and authorize the superintendent to sign the easement on behalf of the board. I so move. Support. support. Thank you. The motion has been moved and supported. Colleagues, what questions do we have about the drainage easement? These these two documents, one is was the original and the other is the, re the revised. Yes. So there's actually two documents that I put on your desk tonight, and one is the most recent revised easement, and then uh, the next one is a maintenance agreement. Um, the maintenance agreement was added by the county at the last board meeting, which is why we pulled the easement at that night, because we just found out about it that day. Um, we have not finished negotiating with it. We we're just asking for permission to sign them once we finished negotiating with them. We're basically making sure that the liability that... Um, and the responsibility for the district is minimized um, in re relation to this. Um, to recap, we started with a easement from the county that basically was um, forever and allowed them to use our property in whatever way they want and put anybody on that property that they want. And we pulled that back into, no, you can have this little, little piece. You have to let us know if anybody's using it. You have to let us know when you're using it. You have to let us know what you're doing with it. If it's, something different than what it's being used for now. Um, the maintenance agreement we're going through because we're making sure that our liability is only for the exact same uh, easement area and that if there's a problem further down, it is not our issue and it is not our cost. So we are going through these very carefully, but it is taking us a lot longer than we expected. Um, but they do require us to have this before they finish um, the permit to finish the parking lot at Stepanski. Um, now, usually when someone tries to take your property for an easement, they would have to pay for it. Uh, is that what they're offering us? They're offering us a dollar, yes. Okay. I mean, just because, I mean, if they were to come onto my property and say, hey, we want to dump water on your 
part of the property to keep it off our roads, which you have to put it somewhere, I understand. Right. But again, we've, we're spending a terrific amount of money on our parking lot to keep all of our water onto our site. That's mm -hmm. just what you're doing now. Correct. That wasn't done in the past. But I just, I don't like the idea of they're not giving us money for our property. I don't support it for that reason. And I understand, but we are making sure that we retain ownership of this property. So say in 30 years or 50 years, we want to redo this property. We have full rights to, to redo this, even this section. So, so this, this easement, easement isn't a lifetime? I thought that that's what it's saying in here, that it's we must saying, maintain it. We must maintain it while we're using it as a drainage area. But if we decide to redo that property for whatever reason, we can redo this easement as well. The easement does not keep us from redoing anything with that property, including, let's say, if we um, wanted to build right up uh, on there and we had all the proper permits and, and, and the proper uh, design for it, we can do it. So that's what we're trying to put into this easement is that if we change our mind and as many years as that is, and we want to use that section for something else, as long as there's water drainage allowed along that section, we can do that. We did not want to put us into any place where we could not use that property as we so fit at any time in the future. Right, but we're still negotiating that part of it? They're, they're opening up a little bit, but okay. yes. But yes, I mean, we don't yes. have a set deal. We're, we're still negotiating for them to use our property and they'll decide whether we can or can't. They won't sign off on our parking lot until we do this. I understand that part of it. But if a utility company comes and uses your land to put up a telephone pole or something like that, there, there's usually a, a value, compensation for that. And I, without, I have a problem. I think what we're trying to um, incorporate in this to ease your mind is that they're getting the use of the property while we are agreeing to the use of the property. So we already had decided that that was gonna be part of the drainage for this property and had already decided that's where it was. They want an easement for it, fine, but it's still our property and we still decide the use of it. So at some point in the future, if we decide to change our design, we still have that right and they cannot override that right. And again, I, I received it tonight on my desk. I don't vote on those things. Pardon? I don't vote in support of anything that comes on my desk tonight. Preview. And like I said, we have not finished negotiating. We just want the, the um, authority to, once we're done, send it to everybody and then have the superintendent approve it. I'm concerned that if we keep waiting, that um, if we have to wait a month in between, that we may miss an opportunity to have the parking lot finished in time. Um, I'm not sure that this is feasible, but we have, I know, incurred a significant amount of legal costs because we've been going back and forth on both documents, the drainage easement as well as the storm and water easement maintenance now, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. Is there any way that the cost can be borne by them? Not necessarily compensation, but... I would love to have that conversation with them because I do feel that they have not been as... Um, on target with timing as we would like. So that will probably be part of the conversation is our disappointment with how long this process has taken and why it has not been more um, timely. So that, because we started this in mid-November. Right. And we were under the impression that we could finish it in, in December. Right. And that has not proven. And, and, and it's become such a protracted thing and the ones that are making a lot of money are the attorneys that are having to review, and, and we need them. I, absolutely, right. we have to protect our interests, but it's really frustrating to me that we're basically, I get that we need to use this as well, but we're giving them an easement and it's costing us a fortune. Right. It makes no sense. Right, and, and I am keeping it down because what I have um, done is talked to our attorney with Clark Hill and told him the parameters and everything, so then he works directly with their attorney. So it's not what normally happens a lot of times is the attorney right. talks to us, we talk to them. It's like, no, we're cutting Game it out, which, which helps um, reduce the cost to us as well. But yes, we will have that conversation with them because I'm, I am incredibly frustrated by this process where they have had this information for two years. We've been very forthright with what we've been doing with this entire design. And like I said, adding that maintenance agreement at the last point was very frustrating, but I'm not going to have anything signed by the district that is not in the best interest of the district. So we're, yeah, it's probably a conversation we're gonna have. And, and I will say as well, just as a, a follow-up to uh, Mr. Petrucia's comments that 
not only did we, are we we're as being asked to approve something and we don't know what we're approving because it hasn't been completed yet. That's an uncomfortable feeling to say, uh, we're going to approve what, we, what hasn't been negotiated. And that's, I'm not, I, I'm not comfortable with that. Just personally, I'm not comfortable with that. Would it be, I don't know, professional, reasonable, whatever, to maybe remind them that we also just pass a resolution for them to be able to do the bridges over by Riverside? And so maybe that, like we have done things to help them out yes. so that they're able to get their grants. So the yes. fact that they are being a little unreasonable with this, I don't know if that would be, if we have any leverage with that. I, will, I am planning on using everything that I can because like I said, this should have been a very simple, but at the same time, I'm. my feeling is that they've never had anybody push back. They probably had people just sign it and walk mm -hmm. away, and I'm not comfortable with that. Um, like I said, if, if I'm looking at it and I'm really uncomfortable, um, and then I have Mr. Motes, who is our attorney with Clark Hill, who's been doing this for many districts um, with the county and, um, and as well as other counties, he even found things that were even deeper that I would not have known about. And so that's where we're, we're very upset with the fact that um, it's so one-sided from the county's perspective. Yeah, I don't, I don't like that. I feel like we're kind of being held hostage on getting our parking lot done. Correct. We, to be at their whim. And, and it's a little concerning. I mean, I, I agree with um, Member Sutherland to, to, to just sign off on something that we haven't seen. It, it is a little bit uncomfortable. It, it's uncomfortable. It's not, I'm, I'm not sure how I feel about that, especially knowing, I, I almost feel like they're trying to strong arm us. And that, right. that seems right. incredibly unfair. Right. What I'm asking you to do is just to approve us to do an easement and do a maintenance, not to approve the language here because we are not done, but knowing that when we are done and the attorney has uh, written off and said, yes, this is our best thing, that it is in the district's best interest to do this and will minimize any exposure for the district um, long term. What is, what is the... Um so just to be clear what the question is in front of us, uh, so it is recommended that the board approve the superintendent to sign the easement. Right. Correct. Uh, yeah. So in, I don't, I trust Scott and you and our attorney, so I personally, I don't have a problem with them signing off on it. I don't. I think part of, I think part of is we wouldn't know what the easement is because it hasn't well, you know what the easement is. It's, it is that 10 foot by 70 foot section. We're just arguing over how much right they have to use it without our permission and our oversight. So would this come back to us to then vote on? I would, length? you do not have to. You can say that you're approving an easement and the superintendent can sign off on it when it has gone through all of it, or we can bring it back. I might suggest that if it's a one item, we might have to call a special meeting. And the, that would be that a would great be opportunity okay with the board. to, you would be able to review it, be able to take a look at it, but we wouldn't necessarily have to wait an entire month once it's approved. Would it still accommodate your timeline if we added it as an agenda item to the COW meeting? That would probably work pretty well, yes. I do want to thank you for going to bat for us. I mean, this is it, this seems so unreasonable that you have to be going through this. So thank you. I it is appreciated because I'm thank you for sticking to yeah. your guns and and not letting them strong arm us. And and honestly, this is part of my job. I feel that every contract we sign should at least be neutral if not in our favor. And like I said, when I see these from other government agencies, that doesn't mean I'm gonna accept them. And so, yes, I will. And, and Jeremy, I've worked with Jeremy for a long time with a couple other districts and he knows me and he knows that I'm not gonna just accept it. So um, we'll be reasonable, but we will not allow the district to be taken advantage of. So. Well, that is very, very much appreciated, thank you. Does it help you at all in that process if the board 
were to, I, I don't, I can't speak for any other board member, but if the board were to vote it down at this point, does, does that probably, help you in those conversations to say enough is enough? Probably not. What I'd probably point out is that we brought it several times and we've had to pull it and then we had this conversation and they are equally up, upset about the fact that it has taken long, it has taken too many of our hours and it still is not a fair agreement. And it's costing us a fortune. Yes. At, you know, yes. at their hand. Yes. I think if I just ask for you to pull it, that would be enough. Probably if there is a, if, if the board is uncomfortable, we would have to have a motion or um, something. We can call the question and vote on this. But if there's a motion to do something else with this, do I have a motion? Do we have to vote because we've already seconded it? Depends on what second. It's been seconded, but it depends what the motion is. <coughs> we can, we can just vote to, to uh, uh, postpone to the next to the next meeting, so we wouldn't have to we wouldn't have to, uh, to, to call the question. I think I would like to make a motion that we table recommendation sixty nine twenty three twenty four relative to the Stepanski easement until further negotiation has occurred and there's a, a more finality in the documentation. Colleagues, the motion uh, which has been moved and supported is to um, table the Stepansk, uh, superintendent recommendation 69-23-24 to table it until a further uh, meeting in the future to be determined. Um, it's been moved and supported. Are there comments or questions, please? Uh, just for the record, I'm, I'm, I'm good either way, but if the majority of the board's uncomfortable or if there are members that are uncomfortable, and it, it's better to probably move on this motion uh, and put it out for a, a future date and see where we go from there, seeing as though it's, it would still be within our timeline. We're getting close, but we still have a little bit of time, yes. Yeah, I, I think to be clear, we, we want, and, and we appreciate you working, we want the best deal here, yes. and we want to make sure that we get that, mm -hmm. um, and we want to make sure we're doing our due diligence as well. So, colleagues, any other comments or questions regarding the motion to table Superintendent's recommendation 69-23-24 to a later date. Nobody has seconded the motion. I, don't I think. did. Oh, Rob you did. did. Okay. Yeah. All those in favor of tabling the motion 69-23-24 to a later date, please signify by raising your hand. Thank you. The motion carries 7-0. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you, Member Sutherland, everyone. Okay, we are on to consideration of certain purchases. Treasurer Donahue, please. Superintendent's recommendation 70-23-24, bus cameras. It is recommended that the board approve the purchase and installation of bus cameras to REI in the amount of $127,727.50. Pricing is from the TIPS Cooperative. Funding for this purchase is from the 31 AA state categorical grant for the 23-24 school year. I so move. Support. Thank you, colleagues. The motion has been moved and supported. What comments or questions do we have? Member Sutherland, please. I'm just, the motion uh, calls out $127,727.50, and in the documented quote, it's $125,727.30. Um, there's a $2,000.20 difference there. It's a typo. Oh, it is, um, yes. for both numbers? Okay. So the 125, 727, 30, um, I, just, we, I just want to make sure yeah. for documentation purposes that that number is modified in the recommendation. Well, it's 125, 727, and 30 cents. Has everyone made that note? We don't need to. Any other comments or questions here, colleagues? So everyone, please note that the uh, amount has been revised to $125,727.30. Okay, all those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Thank you. The motion carries 7-0. Treasurer Donahue, please. 
Superintendent's Recommendation 72-23-24, Algebra 1 and Geometry Curriculum. It is recommended that the Board of Education adopt Envision Math, Algebra 1, and Geometry in the total amount of $275,000, funded by ESSER 3 and the General Fund. I so move. So Support. Thank you. The motion has been moved and supported. Comments or questions? All those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Thank you. Motion carries. 7-0. Treasurer Donahue. No. no. Oh. Did we do social studies? Oh, yeah, but I was removed. Ah, thank you. Well done, everyone. Well done, everyone. All right. Um, okay, we are now moving on to public comments on non-action items. I know we have Mr. Evans. Uh, if you would, please. <laughs> so I think you're, uh, you just joined us here a little bit late, so um, our podium right over there. And as you approach the podium, I'll just remind everyone that our comments are limited to three minutes in duration. Ooh, over, talk fast. <laughs> First thing, I, my name is Ryan Webb. I live at 2900 DeLand. I'm a retired building trades agent. I work with the Waterford School Board on uh, getting your bond appro uh, approvals uh, work side by side with Tom Wiseman on the uh, media centers and the uh, pools for the high schools. And one thing I want to say before my three minutes start is I've been to probably a hundred school board meetings and I've never seen a more professional and I mean nobody's throwing water bottles at each other. You guys are, you guys do a good job and you're very professional. But I'm here obviously with the Bell Development site. You guys are a stakeholder in this. The kids that go to the schools are a stakeholder in this. and. Uh, it's wrong. It's way too close to Kettering. It's way too close to uh, the residential areas. I walk my dog every day down to uh, Kettering's uh, around the fields. Imagine you're up here from another city. You're watching a football game or baseball game, and you're trying to watch a game, and you hear clang, bang, clang, bang, and the obscene noise from this on top of the environmental issues is ridiculous. And what I kind of came here for was to see if maybe the board would be interested in a non-binding resolution against this project because, you know, if it passes, it passes. That's a planning commission job. But there's, I don't believe there's any liability on the school board's part for a non-binding resolution that you're against it. Because when they were illegally pounding and grinding over there, I couldn't sit on my front porch and have a cup of coffee without the noise. Take your dog for a walk around those parks in the evening and listen to the noise. And they're talking about this going on six days a week from seven in the morning till seven at night. Gravel train, double bottoms, clanging uh, tailgates, which is like a shotgun going off. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, this is a great place to live. And other communities coming up here and watch their kids play sports and having this going on in the background right across the pond. I mean, there's nothing to stop that noise. Uh, I see that they built a big berm, they're supposed to plant the trees, and this company's done some shady action as far as compliance, uh, which is also well documented. Like I say, would you guys be interested in a non-binding resolution that you're against this project? Uh, it's, uh, Ryan, what was your last name? Webb, W-E-B-B. Mr. Webb, thank you so much. So, we, um, uh, two things. This is, I think, probably maybe the first time some of the board is hearing about this. I, I Which is amazing because we've been chasing this for weeks. We've contacted uh, school officials, and uh, I'm under the impression that uh, Mr. Lindbergh just heard about this yesterday. I don't know what the chain of command for communication is, but it's not working. We started with just a grassroots bunch of residents. We got some faculty members involved over at Kettering, branched out, made up flyers, and this, I've been involved in a lot of grassroots efforts. This has been amazing, the groundswell on this. I would say that there were probably 500 people within two miles of the school that has this in their possession. And uh, I understand what the zoning is over there. I understand that this company's invested a lot of their uh, resources into, uh, you know, to, to, for this business. But even right now, there's two mountains, oh, three mountains actually, of sod and torn up yards. Is that me? I hope so. Uh, Three minutes. Uh, Our timekeeper says we reached our 30 minutes. Oh, okay. Three well, I'll minutes. let him finish. Anyway, it's wrong. And like I say, a resolution for you guys would be great. And I uh, appreciate your time. If, you, uh, if you're able to stick around maybe for a few minutes after we um, wrap, conclude our, our meeting here, uh, the superintendent might want to uh, just touch base with you. 
All right. And if, and if you would, there, there are green cards up there. If you could just fill them out so we have your contact information, that would be. Uh, All right. May I approach and just give you each a copy of this? Yes. <laughs> so, Mr. Webb, thank you. Uh, if you just have a, a, maybe a few minutes, just right after, right after I mean, our meeting. I don't when it comes to this issue. I mean, this is going to kill my property value, but most of these kids to me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Mr. Evans? Um, I think he can. You got it? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I'll say thank you so much for your patience. So, yes, thank you. So, it means a lot. Is that a non-binding resolution? So, I've seen it done before. Yep. So, when we do the sort of the comments on non-action items, this gives us what we need to put on our next agenda. So we have. To, so, hang out. The superintendent might be able to get a, uh, get you some information here. But um, yeah, I, I just want to say it is, it's a very important issue to many families in the neighborhoods around. Um, me, along with about 12 other uh, neighbors just in my small community, have children under five, uh, within five to 600 feet of this site. Um, southwest winds blow, you know, the cement across. Now they've been shut down for the past, I believe, four months. They have a mound probably 60 feet of cement that just sits there, not being mitigated, dust blowing. You can sit it there and watch it daily, dust blow across all down Warren Drive. Now they did propose a a buffer to the south side of the property, but nothing along the side for Warren Drive, which is mostly affected by this. My property is all affected, so is Kettering, and so is the, the southern adjacent properties. But a huge thing is being not being done, an injustice not being done for the Warren Drive residents. They have no protection at all. Um, no trees, no hill, no buffer, no site plans in sight to protect any of the kids or the neighborhoods around there. So just one other, one other thing I wanna bring up, but just very, we have a lot of passionate residents that are, are gonna be here next Tuesday. And for you guys to, to help us would be a great impact in our fight. So we're not asking for anything um, exceptional. We're not asking to ruin anyone, just a fair assumption of what we're dealing with, right? And what, what's good for the city and what's not, no matter what that area is zoned as commercial, residential, what have you, so. Mr. Evans, thank you so much for bringing this to us, and yeah. thank you for your patience, of course. And thank please you make sure you fill out a green card. If you have just a few minutes, I know Superintendent Lindbergh might want to touch base with you. Really. Thank you very much. But thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Um, okay, colleagues, we are now moving on to Board of Ed reports. Who has a report this evening? Okay, excellent. Um, let's turn it over to Superintendent Lindbergh. Thank you, President Rissich. Uh, this evening we had the opportunity, as you know, to recognize the outstanding accomplishments of Lucy Miles and Dylan Scott. We look forward to celebrating another member of our team at a future meeting. That's Haviland teacher April Lennox, mm. who was recently named 2024 Waterford Foundation Teacher of the Year. Last week we made the surprise announcement in her classroom with her students, and she was taken to uh, Joe Lunghammer uh, Chevrolet, where she was selecting a car. I know what uh, she, uh, her and her family were driving out in. They were test driving. I don't know what they ended up with. But congratulations to April Lennox. Also want to remind the community to tune in to the latest episode of our podcast, WSD Voice, to hear about the innovative approach our human resources department has taken to grow our own talent. Episodes are available on our website and YouTube, and you can subscribe to our podcast on IR Radio. Apple Podcast, Spotify, YouTube, and Amazon Music. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Lindbergh. Um, thank you, everyone, this evening. So, colleagues, at this time, by roll call vote, the Board of, Edge will, Board of Education will recess to closed session in accordance with Section 8A of the Open Meetings Act for the purpose of evaluating the Superintendent of Schools. No action will be, excuse me, no action will be taken during closed session. The regular meeting will be deemed adjourned at the conclusion of the closed session. Secretary Torres, please take roll call vote. <coughs> Member Donahue? Yes. A Member Joslin? Yes. Member Wagner? Yes. Member Ristich? Yes. Member Sutherland? Yes. Member Patricia? Yep. Member Torres, yes. 
Colleagues, let's take a, a few minute break here and uh, we'll meet in our normal spot. Thank you.